I didn't have my mic on. Um, the return, again, tells whether to cancel or to continue to submit. The function, validate form, be valid equals true. We assume that it's true. If it is not true, we test this condition and see if the text name equals nothing. If the document get element by ID text name, that is, if the thing on the page has an ID of text name, if its value is nothing, then we know they forgot the name and we display or we, we, we display our alert and we change that be valid to false. That means, hey, stop the presses. It's, it's wrong. All right? Okay. On the other hand, if this condition is not true, then be valid is still true and we return true. So this is a conditional statement. Sometimes we do these things, sometimes we don't. We do it based on a condition. And this condition is always either true or false. That's only two options. There's not like a yes, no, maybe, some of the times, all of the above, whatever. Notice to do a comparison, we do the double equal. All right? A single equal sign is used in, a, is used in an assignment. A double equal is used in a comparison. If I was going to identify some of the most common JavaScript errors, one of the first most common JavaScript errors is not getting the case of something right. In other words, JavaScript is case sensitive. So document get element by ID should appear exactly like that. If you were to capitalize the D over here or the G over here or anything like that, yeah, I don't know what's going on there, um, then it's not going to work and it's going to give you an error. So that's one of the most common ones. So if your JavaScript isn't working, make sure you have the exact name right, first of all, and make sure that it's case sensitive. Another common mistake is the use of the single equal when you should use a double equal. A lot of times people would just think and say if that equals that and they don't get the results that they'd expect. Now in testing this, you should test it both ways. You should test it once when you enter in a value and once when you don't enter in a value. All right. Testing software becomes um, a real big deal uh, as we start to introduce JavaScript. I mean, it's always a big deal. There's always cross-platform testing and all that. But when you start adding like if statements into your code, you have different branches or different paths that the program can take. So, for example, if I were to go in and add a second validation for age, All right, so now if either of them are missing, forgot the name, forgot the age. If I just forget the name, or if I'm sorry, if I just forget the age, I get forgot the age. There's actually four that I probably should test with this, right? By adding two conditions, there's four paths that this can take. They both could be entered. It, name could be entered and not age. Age could be entered and not name. Or they both could be entered. So really, just by adding a couple of conditions, the number of paths that your program goes through, or could go through, you know, increases very, very rapidly. And that's why software testing is such a big deal. All right? That's why it's so important. As you add things and as the, the, the functions become more involved, if statements inside of if statements, there's a lot of paths, and unless you've really planned your testing to be comprehensive, there's a good chance you're going to miss something. You know, that's why software has bugs, you know, is because it's very, very, very complicated. You know, with 
less than 10 lines of code, we have four conditions. You crank that up to, you know, yeah, you crank that up to 1,000 lines of code, and you have an insane number of conditions uh, and, and possibilities. So, we obviously don't like this because it gives us two alerts. That's really annoying. And if you imagine, especially if you had a larger form that had a bunch of things on it. So what we can do is we could actually write some code to do what we've always done with JavaScript. Always in terms of for the past week or so. All right. Um, we can write it to change the HTML and the CSS. All right. So let's start, and we could do this a few different ways. And I'll do a few of them, and if you were doing this for real, you wouldn't necessarily do all of these ways, right? And it could be overkill, but we'll try a couple different techniques. First, let's make the label look different. Let's make the label red if there's an error. Now, we know that making the label red isn't enough, right? Because for colorblind people, they might miss that. So we're going to make it red, and we're going to make the font bigger. But we could put it in italics, or we could, we could do... Uh, anything with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two classes in here. And I'm going to create a class for normal. And I'm going to say color black font size 1.m or 1m. So that's normal size. Then I'm going to create a second class for error. And I'll make the font a bigger size. Now, I could do this any number of different ways. Like I said, I could make it bold. I could put it in italics, whatever. But I'm going to do it with class. All right? Yeah, with style, with class. Yeah. All right. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I don't want these stupid alerts. What I want to do is I want to point to the thing on the page that is the label that I want to change. And I want to change its class. Well, I have to give these IDs a label. So I'll say ID equals LBL name. Now I can point to these guys. All right. And I can say, how do you change a class? Well, first you point to it, right? Document get element by ID. That says find a thing on the page that has this ID. So what ID do I want? Well, if the name is missing, I want to change this guy. So it'll be label name. How do you change the class of something? I'm going to pretend I don't remember this. Okay? I think I do, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to type in JavaScript change CSS class. Document get element by ID dot class name equals a new class. So We'll go in here and say dot class name equals error. Now, I'm going to be something right now, and if you know what I'm missing, don't say it. If you don't know what I'm missing, then stay tuned. 
All right. So, go and save it. Refresh. All right. There it goes to be bigger and red. What am I missing? To change it back, if, for example, I said, okay, oh, I forgot the name, but I didn't notice the age, and I'd go and click that, it still looks like that has an error. All right? How are we going to fix that? Those are all wonderful ideas, but you're not answering the question. How do we change it back to the normal look if there is something in it? We have an else. All right. An else, what an else does is it gives you what to do if the condition is false. With an if statement, you have a condition. These are the statements that you do if it's true. These are the statements that you do if it's false. So, I'm going to go and do that, and I'm going to change the class back to normal. And I'll do the same thing with this. All right, now, if I forget both of them, if I go in and put in an age, that goes back to normal. All right. Do I need to put here B valid equals true? You're absolutely right. The answer is either no or yeah. <laughs> All right? Yes. Do we have an opposing viewpoint? Well, you can put it, no, just put it down below uh, the last else statement. No, yes. The question was, the question was, do I need to do this? Okay. <laughs> All right, we have a dissenting opinion in the back. You're saying that we do not need to do this. Oh, really? Does anyone have a different answer? Pardon me? If, if the first one comes up false, then the second one is automatically true? Okay. <laughs> the answer is, the answer is no. We don't have to put that in there. Why not? We in, it, no, it absolutely hurts. Well, because this. I put it in both places. Yeah, but we've already initialized it to that. No, All right. Yeah, you could, but that I don't think that would be as readable of a code. The problem is if there was no, if there was an error with the first one and no error with the second one, would hit that else and would reset the valid flag to true. Yeah. And we don't want to do that. So what, this is getting back to what we said last time. It's easier to prove that there's a problem with it than to prove that everything is correct. So we're going to assume everything is correct. The minute we find any problem, the form is not valid. So we set the form to false, or we set that valid flag to false, 
and then we don't uh, touch it the rest of the way through. Because if this is wrong, the fork is not valid. It doesn't matter what this is, or if, as many conditions as we have. As soon as we find a condition that's an error, boom, the form is bad. We do not ever change that flag back to true. We set it at the beginning. We go, we look for errors. If we find an error, we set it to false. And then, finally, when we're done, we return the answer. What's another way to display the error? We, we change the style of this. What's another way we could change the air? Yeah, we could have a little bit of text on the page. All right. So what I do is I'm going to go and I'm going to put a span. What is a span? Have we seen a span yet this semester? I don't, I don't know. What is a span? Yeah, you're, you're definitely right. A span is inline, first of all, and it's sort of an inline equivalent to a div. All right? Now, we didn't talk about this in this class because our focus is on the new HTML5 things like header and footer and, and nav and so on. But the generic container is a way to group a bunch of stuff together. All right? A span is the same thing. It's just a way for us to put some stuff on the page and to identify it. The difference being that a span is in line. So I'm going to say ID equals error name. And I'll put... Their age. All right. Now we haven't. We definitely haven't seen how to go and change the HTML code that's inside the tag. We've changed like the source attribute of an image, and we've changed style attributes of different things. But what I want to do is I want to pop right there. I want to pop in an error message. All right. The syntax to do that is document, get element by ID, find the thing on the page that has a certain ID. What ID do I want to use here? Error name. Yeah, error name. What do I want to change about it? I want to change the stuff between the stuff an end tag. What's that called? That's called the inner HTML. So inner HTML equals, and then I'll say must enter name. Must enter age. All right. Do I have to put anything on the else? Okay, what do I have to put on the else? Right. Sort class. I have to set it. Pardon me? Yeah, it's the exact same reasoning that we did with the class name, right? If, they, if the first round through they forgot the name and age, it would change them both to red. If the second time through they put the name in but did not put the age in, it would still be red unless we go and change it back. Well, same idea here. It would still have the error message in if we did not go and close it.
All right, so we should be okay with that. All right, so we come in, everything's set like that. Oh, okay, we're putting it there. All right, what, now we go correct the name and it gets rid of the error message for name and it keeps the error message for age and keeps that. We could also do something where we had an area on the page that we accumulated all the errors. Remember, I'm going over uh, several options here. You wouldn't necessarily want to do all of these, right? But I could do this. I could have down here somewhere I could have an error list. All right. I have an error list here, an ID called error list. Every time I find an error, I want to add an li to the inner HTML. So, what I'm going to do is, is what? I'm going to say, the error list inner HTML equals the error list inner HTML, because I don't want to get rid of what's there already. Plus, and it'll be a L name. Now this one I'm going to handle a little di bit different because I'm putting all in one place. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to initialize this at the very beginning and clear out all the errors and recreate them this time. Because I have to do that in this case because I don't have a separate error for All right. I actually could, in addition to this, I could have predefined a bunch of LIs and just slide the error message in there, then I wouldn't have to create the LI. All right. So there's a bunch of ways that we can do validation. Again, this class isn't meant to be um, a comprehensive list of, of everything you can do in JavaScript. What I want to point out more is sort of the general concepts. Let's revisit the general concepts with this validation. First of all, user event sets the ball. All right. In this case, it is an on submit event. It could be, we could make it an on click event, but we discussed earlier in the class that an on submit event actually could be better, all right, because there can be multiple ways to submit a form. All right? And we want to perform regardless of how the form gets submitted. I've actually seen like long forms where they have a submit button. So like if there's some stuff and you don't fill it out, you can click the submit button up there. All right? If I 
event on the submit button, then I'd have to duplicate it. Whereas if I put it on the on submit, I do it there. Uh, return values. We talked to functions a few times ago. An R is like X is the information that you want the function to act on. All right. So we had an example last time when we did an image swap. We gave as an argument the name of the image that we wanted to change, and we gave as an argument the file name we wanted to change it to. All right. So that was right, one function to do any image swap. We just had to give that function the proper values. All right. The other part of a function is a return value. And think of the return value as the answer to a function. All right. It could be, you could, for example, have a function to calculate the area of a rectangle. All right where you, your arguments would be the width and the length of the, of the rectangle. The result would be the area. So the return value would be the area. Think about values. You can only return one thing from a function. All right? You can only return one thing from a function. Now, we're keeping it simple. Our example, we're returning a Boolean, which is a true or false. In other examples, if you take C sharp or advanced C sharp, your return values could be more complicated. They could be, for example, an I themselves, which is has multiple attributes and methods and so on. But whatever a function returns, it's returning one of them. All right, can't return two things. All right, and in this case, we call form function. It goes to the problem, examining the form and seeing if it's correct, and it returns a Boolean. A Boolean is simply something that is true or something that is false. All right? If it's true, that value gets passed to the on submit, and the form continues and submits to the server. If it's false, then the form does not get submitted to the server because the data is bad. Why first place? Because this gives immediate response to the user. This code is running in the browser. It's not requiring data through the internet to the, to the server for the server to process it. All right. In addition, it's a benefit for the server because if we forget some key piece of information, the server can't process it. So for example, if we forget a credit card number, all right? The server can't possibly uh, order. So there's no sense sending it to the server just for the server to reject it. The client-side code can just as easily validate it and, and tell you if there's any errors. A final way for us to group statements together. Could you imagine if we tried to put all as part of that on submit. It would be a mess. We could do it actually, and the browser wouldn't care, all right? But it's impossible for us to read. So what we are in JavaScript is we create functions. But the way that we can give a set of statements, a block of statements, a name, and then we can call it wherever we want to. So in this case, we call function validate form. There's no here, there is a return value. Has to match it. The curly brackets show like a block code. It's important to index, especially when you get to JavaScript, because coding. Because you want to be able to tell ants that you have the right number of brackets. That's a very, that's another of those common errors, is if you forget a bracket, all right? And the way 
it indented, I can see at a glance that this belongs to this. This belongs to this. This belongs with this. And so on. The other thing people do is they put the brackets on their own line. And that's fine. I would just say whatever method you use, just be consistent and pay attention to it. Believe me, if you have a big function and you get an error saying that you're missing a curly bracket, if it's not properly indented, it's a nightmare to find it. All right? How do you troubleshoot these things? I talked about common errors. Not having the right number of braces lining up is an error. All right. What do we use braces for? To group statements together. This groups together and says, hey, everything here is part of this function. Everything here is the true part of the if statement. Everything here is a false part. Let's say we forget a brace. And I save it. Notice what happened. Nothing happened. Well, I, let me rephrase that. Not, it's not that nothing happened. It actually did send to the server. All right? It actually did send it to the server. Now, how do we troubleshoot it? The first thing to do is look in the JavaScript console. Not every browser has a JavaScript browser, but Chrome does and Firefox does. Internet Explorer reports the error a different way. All right, and we'll look at this in, in Internet Explorer as well. Now, keep in mind that it's not a person that's looking at this and telling you what's wrong. It's a machine. It's a computer program that is analyzing this. So, the error messages it gives you are going to be cryptic. All right, for example, this one, it says, unexpected end of input. And it says line 53. If we look at line 53 in here, it is the script tag. So, what does that error really mean when it says ex unexpected and? It means that it was expecting to see something that it didn't see. It hit the end of the script and it didn't see something that it expected to see. Well, because we know what's wrong, we know that it expected to see another bracket. In other words, it is going through and it's lining up all right. No, it's expecting to see the bracket. This sees that this this lines up with this. This lines up with this. This lines up with this. This lines up with this, and therefore there is no brace that lines up with that. So we put the brace back in, and we're back in business. The other part of the air Oh, I must have saved it. The other part of error says validate 
form is not defined. All right? That's where there's a couple of possibilities. First possibility to check for would be to look to make sure you have it spelled right. All right? And in addition to making sure you had it spelled right, have it make sure that you have it spelled right using the proper case for it. But if we look, enough we do have it spelled right. So what does it mean that function isn't defined? What JavaScript works this way. If it finds a big enough error in something, it doesn't then even know that that function exists. All right? So because we forgot to close it with that brace, that's an error, that's a problem. It doesn't load that function correctly, so it doesn't know about that function now. So even though that function is in our code, the error kept it from loading correctly. Now, not errors are like that. So for example, if I spell valid wrong, if I typoed on valid, that's an error, because there's no such thing as be veiled, all right? But I'm not going to get an error saying that it can't find the function. All right? We did not get the error saying it didn't find the function. What we got is, unconference, be veiled is not defined. Now, that's an actually fairly descriptive error, right? We can look and say, oh, yeah, I spelled that wrong. Right? Um, in other cases, the kind of error that you get um, is a little more cryptic. So it really takes some time and experience to sort of uh, be able to translate the error messages into something that is intelligible. We're getting a semicolon. actually is not an error. doesn't complain. still works. And yes, it did. Uh, in cases where the, the lacking a semicolon did burn, yeah. So uh, again, I usually, I usually put it in. Remember when you, um, when you break the rules of a language, you're, you're at the mercy of the language then, just like with HTML, if you forget an ending tag, or with CSS, if you put something bad in. Um, you're at the mercy of it. In other words, it could do what you wanted, all right, but it might not, all right. And therefore, you know, your best bet is to to um, do it correctly. One last thing that we could do, we could throw in here, is we could test to see if age was actually a number, all right. So. I'm going to go, and I could probably do a couple different ways. I'm going to test. I'm going to put this in the else part. This is a nested if. These get really difficult to debug if you do not do the indenting correctly. is numeric. All right. So I can go and say if there's actually two options that we have. There is an is numeric 
and there is is not a number. So the error condition is if is n a n. Let me double check the syntax of that. You're pretty clever. I think you could figure out what to do. You'd have then a condi another condition that says if you'd pick the reasonable range, uh, um, reasonable range for the date or the age, and you'd test for that. Now, what we do is make sure that our um, error message is specific to the error that we're getting. Here we're getting two kinds of errors, right? We're getting an error if they haven't entered anything, or we're getting an error if they don't enter a number. So I'm going to change the error message to say must enter a number. Must enter a number. And now, if we go and do this, must enter age, if we type in some garbage, then it tells us we must enter. We could add conditions over and over to this to make sure it wasn't a negative number, for example, to make sure that it was greater than um, some value. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what we would put in as the largest value. 120? Anyone ever lived to 120? I don't know. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so we could do that. All right. Um, in addition, we could write additional validations for all sorts of things. For the name, we could check to make sure it was a certain number of characters. Right now, we are literally looking for nothing in that field. If you typed anything in, even a comma or a space or whatever, uh, then it would uh, pass the validation. Now, keep in mind, sort of the last word here on validation, is that you do the client-side validation for two reasons. One is to give your users immediate feedback. Two is to lessen the load on the server. In other words, if the data isn't valid, there's no sense sending it to the server. You will repeat the validation on the server. Why? Because people can turn off JavaScript. All right? And secondly, you, in many cases, you do more extensive validation on the server side that you can't do on the client side. For example, I could make sure that I entered in a 15-digit credit card number, but to validate that it wasn't stolen or to validate that it wasn't over its limit or whatever, that would require the tools that are only available on the server. All right, so looking up in the database and all that sort of thing can't be done on the client. Um, can't, can't's a big word. Uh, can't practically or securely be done on the client side. All right. Um, the other thing um, that um, requires some server-side scripting is we can use um, JavaScript to do AJAX stuff. And AJAX is pretty cool stuff. It's where you have a page that mixes client and server scripting. So if I go to Google, and it mixes it in a, in a clever, sophisticated way. Let's go to Google on Chrome, exactly. As I start typing in H, notice it gives me a list of the most popular search terms for H. HT. HTM, and so on. All right? That's getting the raw data from the server, but it's using the JavaScript to format it. So it's a, it's a different sort of exchange between that. And we cover that in CISS 232, which you all should take. All right. <laughs> well, you should regardless of whether you have to or not. All right, any questions? All right, see you upstairs. <laughs>